Um, I don't know about you guys, but I, you know, I, this is not a graduation sermon, but I think back when I was 18 years old and I graduated high school and after I made sure I had a diploma in there because I wasn't necessarily sure it was going to be there, I knew what my plan was going to be. I was going to go to Lake Christian College. I was going to become a youth minister. I was going to work in the church the rest of my life. And that was my plan. I, I, I never anticipated doing much else than that. And so I was excited about what I was going to do. Now there's a guy named uh, Adoram Judson. You may have heard of him. He was a Baptist preacher from uh, way back when, was born in 1798. And when he graduated high school, he knew what he wanted to do. And he wanted to go to seminary, and he wanted to be a missionary. Now, upon his about 25th birthday, he grad, 24th, 25th birthday, he graduated high, uh, college, seminary. And he did so well that he was actually offered a job in the Boston area at a very predominant church. His, his mother, his sisters were ex super excited because they would be closer to them. He could live at home, uh, be back with the family. And, and it was lucrative. He, they were going to really bless him. And he said, my heart has never been there. My heart has always been outside of the border of this, this country. He turned down that job, and he followed what the Lord led him to do, which is what he always wanted to do, and that was he went to Burma. And in his time in Burma, it is estimated that he brought around 40,000 people to Christ in his career. You know, when we follow God's true leading, we can be crazy blessed. We can be crazy blessed. But I believe that there were times that he felt overwhelmed. I think there would be times that he was like, maybe, maybe even scratched his and said and thought, man, I could have stayed in Boston. I could have had a cool accent by the time I was done. I could have, you know, stayed with mom, and, and, but he knew that that was not what he wanted to do. I, I read this. I thought it was very interesting. During the years that, uh, as premier of the Soviet Union in office, uh, Nikita Khrushchev, you may have heard that name, he was uh, in office from 1953 to 1964, he denounced many of the policies and atrocities of Joseph Stalin. In the midst of his speech, a heckler once sounded out, you were one of his colleagues, why didn't you stop him? And Khrushchev screamed, who said that? Well, obviously, there was deathly silence in the audience, and no one dared move a muscle. Then Khrushchev replied this, now you know why. Fear will silence us, fear will confuse us, fear will paralyze us. It is like the coils of a snake that tighten around its victim so that the prey breathes out its, um, breathes out its constricted self tighter, thus not allowing the lungs to take a breath. It's stealthy, it seeks the innocent among us and tightens itself around us. We can be paralyzed when, and, uh, when we find out that it's difficult to breathe. There is only one who can get us out. No, this is not a sermon about fear, but it is a sermon about being overwhelmed. Now, lately, you know, my life's been crazy. I know many of you, graduates and things going on, I, I usually strive on pressure. I love pressure. I really do. I, I just, it, it excites me. But lately, with things going on with my dad, things going on with Denise's dad, are things that are really out of my control. And so I'm finding that as much as I love pressure, I don't like pressure of things I can't do something about. I I've been very overwhelmed the last couple of weeks. Uh, this past weekend, uh, our house is VBS Central. We've got cardboard everywhere. We've got signs everywhere. I was out in the garage till about 10 o'clock last night figuring out how to make some different stands for we've got six-foot nights that we're going to put around the church. It's going to be awesome. It's going to be great. 
that's kind of things I can do about. I was actually relaxing last night at 10 o'clock at night, but then it dawned on me at 10 o'clock at night, I had not written a sermon. <laughs> Usually by Monday of, of the Sunday, or the Monday before a Sunday, I'm already researching and praying, and this week, I've walked into the bathroom twice and not known why I went. <laughs> I've just been, my mind is in 20,000 different places. So last night, uh, as I'm building this frame and went, holy crikey, tomorrow is Sunday. I got nothing. So I stopped what I was doing and I leaned over my workbench and I said, okay, Jesus, you got to have this one because I got nothing. And he's like, and I just kind of felt him say, Bill, I've been telling you all week. And it came to me yesterday morning. Now tell me, you know, I've always said, you know, you really need to read your Bible. But I'm telling you, I am a proponent of getting the email at 8 o'clock in the morning and giving me a Bible verse. Because yesterday morning, I got a Bible verse out of Joshua. And that's what your sermon is going to be on today. That Bible verse carried me all day yesterday. It carried me and reminded me that even in my weakness, even in my befuddledness, even in my confusion, even in my stupidity, God's got this. It, too often I try, I try to do it. You know, I, I always pray for strength. I always say, God, lead me. But then I go, I'll just get it done. Because obviously, you know, I'm so full with the Holy Spirit. I know that whatever I'm doing is blessed by the Holy Spirit, right? Not always. I found yesterday that I have to remember that he is truly in control. And I say that, I've preached that to you for five and a half years, and I needed that bolt of lightning to hit me last night to remind me that, Bill, you're human. Bill, yeah, sometimes you can be upset, frustrated, not know which direction to go. But if you trust me, I will get you there. I will get you there. I will get you where you need to be. So if, you're, if you have your Bibles, turn with me. We're going to be in Joshua this morning. Now, uh, to set the stage a little bit, um, Joshua 1 is the beginning of the book. We know that at this point, uh, Moses has, has brought them to the promised land. They're kind of standing in front of it. Moses has been kind of training Joshua that will take the place of Moses since Moses is not allowed to cross over. And Moses, as the second, was probably like, okay, it's cool. I can do this. I can do this. But then it happened. And I can only imagine the, the, the terror that went through Moses. It, it's one thing to be in, in charge. It's another thing to be number two. You know, if you're number two, you can always blame number one. Right? Well, it was his idea. Well, he wanted to do it. I told him not to. But, you know, he didn't listen to me because he's number one. So let's start it. Now it came that after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, uh, that the Lord spoke to Joshua, the son of Nun, uh, Moses' servant, saying, Moses, my service is dead. You, therefore, arise, cross the Jordan, you and all the people to the land which I uh, am giving them to the sons of Israel. Today, I'm challenging you to all go to Burma and become missionaries. Ready? I want your flights by Friday. I want you packed by Thursday. I want you to sell your house, sell all your belongings, and you're going to Burma. What do you think? You ready? Okay, we got one taker. I don't even know how long it takes to get a passport, so maybe Friday may not be a doable thing, but... That's kind of what he just told Joshua. 
hey, you know, just so you know, um, you, you know, you probably already know Moses is dead. Um, so here's what I want you to do. I want you to take the thousands of people that you have been helping lead with Moses, and you're going to go into the promised land. It will all be yours. But here's what I want you to do. I want you to remain faithful to me. I'm willing to bless you with all of this, but I want you to remain utterly, absolutely faithful to me. And by the way, the 400,000 people that are behind you, they're looking to you. They're looking to you for spiritual guidance. They're looking to you for emotional support. They're looking to you for physical support. They're looking to you in absolutely every aspect of their life. Good luck. What do you think? My first thought is, is Aaron was probably like, Okay, this is the day that I've, I've trained for. This is the day that I've watched. I, I'm graduating high school. I'm graduating seminary, and now it's on me. And then he realized the gravity of everything and said, I can't do this. Which is exactly, if you look at every person in the Bible that God used, is exactly where he needs you to be. I can't do this. But God says, but I can. And that's where I think we need to remember. From every place in which the sole of your foot treads, I have given to you just as I spoke to Moses. From the wilderness uh, and this Lebanon, even as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, and all of the Hittites, as far as the great sea toward the setting of the sun will be your territory. No man will be able to stand before you all the days of your life, just as I have been with Moses. I will be with you. I will not fail you, or I will not forsake you. Now, first one, be strong and courageous for for you shall give the people the possession of the land which I swore to their fathers to give them. Number two, only be strong and very courageous. Be careful to do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left, so you may have success wherever you go. The book of the law shall not depart from your mouth. But you shall meditate it on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do according to what is written in it. For when you, for then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have success. I think we have the key to life in those few verses. Two times he said what? Be strong and courageous. You know what that means? Even in your weakness, <clears throat> be strong and courageous. Even when you feel you can't do it anymore, be strong and courageous. Even when you want to give up, you're at your wit's end, be strong and courageous. Well, how in the world am I supposed to be strong and courageous if I'm ready to just throw my arms up in the air and be done? I think he tells us to remember his law, to remember his words, to remember who God is. I will never leave you or forsake you. So your strength and your courage doesn't have to come from, from your back pocket. Your strength and courage needs to come from the one who created you. The one who knows you. The one who knows how vulnerable you can be. How frustrated you can be. How happy you can be. How joyful you can be. When we put God first above everything and I truly mean that God is my number one Denise knows that 
Denise is my number two. She will never be my number one. Because then I make her my God. And she will never be that. When I say put God first, I mean it. In everything you do, God has to be first then everything else falls in. I want a blessing from God in my marriage, but, my, but Denise is number one. Then who am I asking to bless the marriage? Another human. I love my kids. They're my number three. But if I, if I put them above God, then who am I trying to, who am I praying to to give them strength and courage and the the rest of their life, I can't I can't pray to Murphy and say, Murphy, I want you to have a great life, so you could do this. No, that's not how this works. I have to pray for God, to God, for Murphy and Finnegan and Grace and Allison and Cody, and I'm not going to name my grandkids because I'll probably forget one. God has to be number one. I that's what he just said. No man will be able to stand before you all the days of your life. I will be with you. I will not fail you. I will not forsake you. If you keep me number one, unfortunately, we see the history of the Bible, and they often put somebody else in number one spot. Trust me, I, I, I've done that. When I fell away from the church, it's because I had put my job and many other things in my number one spot. And guess what happened? I stopped receiving the blessing. I stopped receiving God's courage in my life and strength in my life. I began to become wishy-washy. And I began to want more of the world. And the world led me down a path that is not pleasant. God came to Je uh, Joshua and said, it's time. It's time for you to do what you've been trained to do, what, what you've been raised to do. I'm telling you today that it is time for all of you to do what God intended you to do. You understand that? I'm not saying it's time for you to go get overtime at your job. I'm not saying it's time for you to, to go do other worldly things. I'm saying today is the day for you to put God first, to know his law, to know his words, and do what he intended you to do. And that can be a whole array of things. Maybe some of you may, uh, uh, someone I know from Hersher at the age of 42, I think he's 42, went back to Bible college, just graduated this year, and became a minister. Don't say that you can't do something. Because with God, you can do anything he leads you to do. Maybe the next Jesus Revolution pastor is in our midst. I don't know. But don't ever take it out of the picture. Because at the age of 50, you may be retiring from your job and <laughs> starting a new one. See, when I finally put God first, I said, I, I can't do this anymore. I put God first. Back in 2010, he called me to go back to college because I was an idiot and quit. And I thought it was just okay to finish something, right? Finish what you started. My mom and dad always told me that. Grandma and grandpa always told me that. Finish what you started. And I thought, okay, it is to finish what I started. That's, that's it. That's what I'm going to do. I'm still dying a fireman. I had no idea that seven years later, after I graduated, that God would call me into a service. But it was only when I said, God, I will give you my all. God, truly, I have to put you first. And, and you know what was funny is when he called me in, he goes, by the way, it's not going to be easy. You're, you're going to have days. I have so many pastor friends, and they're like, you sure you're being called to this? I said, yeah, I, I really believe I am. I, it's just, I, I feel like I am. And they're like, okay, praise God. Uh, a good friend of mine, Paul Vale from Whiting. I grew up with him. Been a pastor in Whiting. Took over for Brother Bob um, 23 years ago, I believe it is. 
And I had a long talk with Paul, and he goes, okay. He goes, this is what you were supposed to do back in, you know, a long time ago. And he goes, it's, I'm, I'm so glad you're finally hearing God again. And I did. Are you at a point in your life that you've put God first and you hear God? If you are, keep God there. Don't let things get before God. This week, I'm admitting to you as your pastor that I have allowed things to get in my way of God. I've been confused, frustrated, angry, upset. I've been mad. I've been sad. And last night, as I'm using a nail gun, God took a hammer and smacked me up next side of the head and said, Bill, first off, you have a sermon in 12 hours. You might want to get started, but here, I tell you what, here it is. I will tell you, last night I got, and usually a sermon will take me somewhere between six and ten hours, because I really try to research and do everything else. Last night I finished a sermon, this sermon, in about 20 minutes. I sat down and I said, okay, God, I've got nothing. I'm so tired, I can't see straight. I'm, I'm just still, my mind's on 15 mi million things. And he goes, Bill, shut up. Sit down and let me help you. And 20 minutes later, so elders, don't dock me, but <laughs> 20 minutes later, I was shutting my laptop, and Denise said, I haven't even finished studying for my little kids yet. And I'm like, you need more Jesus. <laughs> I won't show you the bruise. <laughs> Let me leave you with this, though. For the third time, Jesus the Lord told Joshua, I have, not have I not commanded you? People, has God not commanded you? Have you not given your life to him? Be strong and courageous. Do not tremble or be dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Three times in nine verses, God says, you don't have to do it by yourself. You do not have to do this alone. I don't care if you're in a crowd of people. Many times we've all felt like that. We could be in a crowd of people and still feel alone. God says you will never be alone because I am with you. Always, no matter where you go, to the bathroom, to Kohl's, to Home Depot. Okay, maybe not at Home Depot because I get in trouble there. You go to church, you go to your workplace, you're driving in your car, you go to Strax. I don't care where you go, I will always be with you. Three times he said, be strong and courageous. But three times he followed it up with how are we to be strong and courageous? Because we have God. I will be with you. You know, there's that poem of footprints. And, and I love that poem. I really do. But I think we miss the point of, of footprints in the sand. You know, I'm walking along and I see two, foots of, two sets of footprints. And then in the darkest parts of my life, I only saw one set of footprints. And, and the Lord responds, it was at that point that I carried you. Yeah, I'd like to say when I look at my life, when I see two foots of, sets of footprints, that's the dark times. Because when I give my life, when God carries me all the time, that's the happy times. I, I really think that that poem, as much as I love it and I understand what it's trying to say, I think it's wrong because it's when God carries me that things go well. When I try to walk on my own and do it on my own and think I got this is when things start to crumble. God says, I will never, get, get the gravity of that word, never. That means like, n never. That means, how do you describe never? I will never leave you or forsake you. I will never turn my back on you. Never. 
even in the times of me being a complete moron, God did not turn his back on me. God still loved me. God still wanted me to come home to him. Last night, writing this sermon, I was just flooded with emotions going all week. I have been beating my head against the wall. I don't know if I'm coming or going. Three kids are all working. Nobody has a license yet. I'm trying to take care of things with my dad, which that's a debacle. Denise's dad not doing well. Denise out of her mind because VBS starts tomorrow. And woo, VBS starts tomorrow. And I thought, what in the world? And I realized that the reason I'm, ah, the home alone kid running around my house is because I haven't, giving it to God. Last night in the shop, I just put the tools on and I'm like, God, I can't, I can't, I can't anymore. And he said, Bill, you think you're so strong, but the world will beat you down. Bill, don't fear, but take strength and courage. At one time, uh, it was completed in 1937. The Golden Gate Bridge was the longest sus suspension bridge in the world. During the first phase of the project, 23 men fell to their death. There was very few safety devices, and things seemed to be going from bad to worse. So when it was about halfway completed, they decided to take another look and to make some changes. And here's what they did. They reorganized. They built the largest net ever and attached it under the area where the men would be working. Was it worth the cost? Was it worth the time to, to do what they did? We'll just ask the 10 men who fell after that, but fell into the net. Not only did it save those lives of the 10 men, the work actually was done sooner than they planned because they no longer lived in fear of falling. God is not just your safety net. God is the hand that holds you. God is the one that wants to lift you up. God is the one that wants to give you courage. God is the one that will give you strength to get through the days you don't think you can. And he will never leave you. Now, I don't know about you. This sermon was not for you today. It really wasn't. It was for me. It was to remind me that no matter what comes up, what Satan, because it's, it's Satan. He, he wants to distract me. He wants to deter me. He wants me to make me fear God says, I, I, I already beat him too. So whatever is, the, whatever is going on, I've got you. Let me leave you with this last. Uh, Adoniram Judson once said this. There is no success without sacrifice. If you succeed without sacrifice, it is because someone has suffered before you. If you sacrifice without success, it is because someone will succeed after you. No matter what you do for the kingdom of God, you will be blessed. And those who hear your words, see your actions, and see your life putting God first will be blessed. That, my friends, is our charge for the day. Put God first. Find his strength. Find his courage. And then when you got it, give it away, give it away, give it away now. Because that's what we're called to do. We're not called to be muscle men. We're not called to carry the weight of the world on our shoulder. We're called to be children of the king and make more children. Today, take courage. Take strength. Because today, the Lord is with you. He will not leave you. And he will never, ever, forsake you. Father, we thank you for these words. We thank you for the encouragement of these words. We thank you for the peace and the grace and the mercy that are in these words. These words that have told us that we, being buffoons sometimes, being confused and frustrated, angry, mad, sad, are still being carried by the one who loves us and the one who created us.
Father, we praise you for that blessing. We thank you for all our blessings, but we thank you for that specific blessing to know that in our worst days, you are there. In our greatest days, our greatest joys, you are there. Father, today I pray that as we leave this building, we will walk out standing a little bit taller, knowing that the creator of all things is the one that is carrying us and giving us strength and giving us courage when we don't think we have any left. Father, we praise you for Jesus. We praise you for what he did on the cross, that we can come before the throne of grace right now to worship and praise you, to thank you, to honor you, to, to just give you everything. Father, help us to remember to make you first in life of all things. And we pray, Father, that we will glorify you in our actions and in our words. We praise you, Father, for this week that's ahead. Thank you for all the work that's gone into it. But I pray, Father, that this week that children will write your words on their, on their heart. I pray, Father, that the, the leaders and all those who have volunteered will be blessed and encouraged as they see the, the joy in kids' faces, as they get to sing and dance and worship Jesus. Father, we offer this next week up to you. Father, I offer everyone in this building up to you. Use us, Father, as your children, as heirs to the throne, as conquerors because of Jesus' blood. Father, we just praise you, and we offer this in the holy, awesome, cool name, the insanely awesome name, the holy name of Jesus, our Messiah. Amen.